The Lord be with you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce one of my professors, and I will be taking a class with him this summer. Um, as I said at the service, this will be, I think, at least my third class with him. And let me tell you something. I'm very picky, so he, he is absolutely fabulous. Um, professor Mobley, um, Old Testament professor, and the best part about it is he's talking to us about something that's really dear on our hearts, um, which is environmental stewardship. So I'm going to turn it over with, to him, but let's give him a round of applause and get him excited. Well, I didn't need the round of applause to get excited. It was just hearing the names of all those people joining the parish and seeing all those kids. Yeah, that's what uh, made me excited. I've been here before, and um, I'm just sorry I can't stuff myself on donuts yet. Um, in the 5th century B.C., there was a Greek scientist, philosopher, Hippocrates, Hippocrates, who's called the father of medicine. Hippocrates now belongs to the history, but not the practice of medicine. Our Bible is at least as old as Hippocrates. We still practice our religion based on the Bible. That means that we have to constantly reinterpret and renew our understanding of the Bible. And what we say in our class on uh, the Bible and environmentalism is we need to reboot Bible in light of our present understanding of creation. So that's what this is all about, reading the Bible with new eyes. But as it turns out, part of the problem is we do need to reinterpret the Bible. But the other problem is we've just misunderstood it all these years. Because as it turns out, the Bible has a far more traditional, and I say that in a sense as, with, as if we would say traditional cultures, it has a far more traditional view of life on earth. That is, the Bible says that God has covenants with many communities, some of which are human. God has covenants with many communities some of which are human. I want to go ahead and just start reading the Bible, because that's more fun. And then, you know, if there's something to say, we'll say it. So you have a handout. Cheryl was so kind to say those things about me. I love having her in class. I mean, and, and Merrick comes too. You know, uh, oh, this is live streamed, right? I was going to say, when he's not hustling, you know, me to contribute to some book, you know. <laughs> um, so look at Psalm 104. Now, some, I, I know you guys are Episcopals. I grew up Baptist. I'm used to hearing some kind of uh, response. <laughs> so... So are you there at Psalm 104? Yes. Uh, uh, the text be with you and also with you. May, yeah, I just didn't prompt you correctly. Oh, I just love the Episcopal liturgy. Thank you for letting me be there. I do. I love it, especially when you bow to the gospel. To me, that's the most precious gesture. Um, all right, let's just jump right in. Psalm 104. What I'm hoping, you know, I translate these passages um, from Hebrew into English when I'm teaching because um, I want everyone to imagine that the Bible is a text that was just recently 
um, uncovered from underground. It had been, it'd been buried for centuries. And we're reading it for the first time. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then we get into the heart. You know, everyone thinks, oh, the creation story in the Bible is in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is the overture to the entire Bible. And so it's this beautiful piece that has all the themes of the rest of the work inside it. But there are creation texts all over the Bible. In so many ways, uh, creation is, sums up every aspect of God's being. So here we go in Psalm 104. This is, I think, my favorite creation story in the Bible. Bless the Lord, all my soul. The one who sends streams through creek beds. Between the mountains they flow. They slake all the wildlife. Onagers, wild donkeys, satisfy their thirst. Beside these streams, birds of the sky settle. Amid foliage, they give voice. The one who waters the mountains from your chambers by the fruit of your creative works, the earth is satisfied. Can you just feel the dewy freshness of everything and everything having its role? The one who grows grass for animals and plants for people. Turns out we don't eat grass. So they, in turn, can extract bread from the earth. And God grows wine. You know, that little extra that gives enjoyment to the heart of mortals so they can make faces gleam with olive oil. Uh, Olive oil was used as a lotion. And a cosmetic even. So... uh, You know, the the beautiful thing about creation as depicted here is it's not simply utilitarian. It's celebratory. It's festive. Uh, It's like when uh, Jesus says, you know, consider the lilies of the field. Yeah, they not only play a role in the biosphere, they're beautiful. As if one of God's gifts is to ornament the world with beauty. And the one who gives bread that supports the heart of mortals. And now in the next stanza, the trees of the Lord are satisfied. That's interesting. You, you would think, oh, that just means all trees. No, it's very specific. It's the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. Have you been to Muir Woods? Yeah. That's what the the cedar forests of Lebanon looked like. And they were known then as God's forest. That was the uh, phrase they used in that part of the world for that uh, grove. It is there that sparrows nest. And then at the top, storks make their house. There are high mountains for the ibex, And rocks are a refuge for the badgers. Everything has its place. And it's all designed by God. See why I kind of like this better than Genesis 1? Then the moon makes seasons. It determines seasons. The sun knows its setting. Darkness posts up and it is night. And during it, all the forest animals creep around. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they collect themselves and lie down in their dens. And then people go out to their labor. You see the diurnal rhythm when they get to take the stage, when we take the stage. And we just all maintain our shifts for this greater work of life. People go out to their labor. 
until their tasks until evening, and then it's time for darkness to post up and the animals to come out. How manifold are your creative works, O Lord, all of them created by wisdom? I don't have time. Invite me back another time, and we'll talk about why I've capitalized wisdom. Your possessions. Well, you know, in Genesis 1, it says, in the image of God, he created them male and female. And there are many texts in, C in, the, in the Old Testament that talk about God having a teammate on creation morning. And in Hebrew, her name was Hokmah, which means wisdom. So God created the world with wisdom, which, and now I'll just say a little more, I think I would interpret that as physics personified and beautified. A sense of God created the world with intricate patterns. But as always, the Bible makes it into a story and makes these principles into beings and figures we can identify with. So again, how manifold are your creative works, O Lord, all of them created by wisdom. Your possessions fill the earth. Here's the sea, big and wide, doubly so. And there are creeping creatures, uncountable. <laughs> Living things, small and big. You know that phrase in a different way, right? All creatures. I don't know why. When I get around Episcopals, I think, oh, it's a bunch of English people. You know, all creatures, great and small, BBC and all that. Man, where would I be without the BBC? Every evening when the sun goes down. <laughs> I remember being puzzled by my parents, and they would say, well, it's time for Britcoms. And I thought, what? And now there I am. Look, uh, their ships float. Do you see that? Leviathan, whom you fashioned to cavort in it. Leviathan, now what are they thinking? Some big manatee or whale? Blue whale? Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a personal name, Leviathan, that describes some big creature in the sea, and it's out there cavorting. That's part of creation, too. All of them, the lions, the ibex, the badgers, the people, depend on you to provide their food at its time, when you provide it for them, they collect it. When you open your hand, they're well satisfied. When you hide your face, they are devastated. When you gather their breath, they expire and return to the dust. They begin that long journey through nature to eternity. When you send your breath, they're recreated, and the surface of the ground is renewed. And that's, that's the arrangement. You accept it? <laughs> um, now, let me, let me put an edge on this. Uh, you know, I just wanted you to feel kind of the celebratory energy of the biblical sense of a kinship of all with all. Um, but now I gotta, I, gotta, um, I gotta meddle with you, you know, because the problem is Christianity is culpable in environmental degradation. Um, because most of the time, tragically, Devastatingly, 
we've misunderstood the mandate in Genesis 126 for humans to exercise dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the animals of the earth and over every creeping thing, to exercise dominion. The Hebrew word, and I like to say it, even if you don't know it, is rada, rada. And, but it can, mean, it can mean to be in charge of, which, gets, which got translated in the King James as have dominion, but it could also mean to shepherd, which is where we were this morning. And also, there was a great part of the liturgy this morning, a prayer that I almost could have sworn could have come from Psalm 104. Did y'all hear that one? By your command, all things came to be the vast... Anyway, somebody doing some work during the week. Um, Because there's some poetry in that. I was touched by that. So we've we've misunderstood what it means to have dominion. And in the next line, you know, it says, and so God created them in God's image. Male and female, he created them. Well, when we think of the term God's image, and I use it this way too, I often think, oh, the fact that people bear the image of God means that everybody's got a, a little bit of God in them. And every aspect of reality is holy. And amen, sister. Um, but that's not actually what Genesis 126 means by the image of God. So in the ancient world, you know, some king had an empire. And the king can't be everywhere. So the king's in the capital city. But in all the provincial towns, there is an image a statue of the king in the middle of town square. And as long as that image is there, it means the king's domain extends there, even though the king's not there in person. To say we've been made in the image of God means we've been deputized. We've been enlisted to be representatives of the divine rule here when God isn't physically here, though spiritually here. And so the job of those in God's image is to treat the territory just like God would. Just like God would. God who um, marks every sparrow's fall. What dominion What image of God does not mean is that humans are supposed to be the apex predators in the jungle of life. Um, And I I love to quote Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry has written so much about Christianity and and creation and the environment. And he said, um, for the past five centuries, the evangelist walked beside the conqueror and the merchant. Um, so, you know, how do we reboot Bible in the, in the light of this tragic manipulation of religion for human benefit? Um, well, as it turns out, I said this before, the Bible isn't a bad partner in restoring a healthy relationship between the human community and other communities of creation. The problem is we just misunderstood it because we're reading it through Western eyes. A few years ago, I was in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and uh, I was talking to a Lakota elder, and he was talking about their view about all the different communities. He would, he referred to them as nations. And of course, every, we would call, what we would call tribes, they would say each is a nation. But each species of bird is a nation. Each type of fish is a nation. Each 
different niche of the ecosystem is a nation. And what he said is all of these communities, these nations, receive their instructions. And I thought that was fascinating. And that's what they're supposed to do. If you're one of those birds, you're supposed to fly. And there's even a schedule for when you migrate. And you are supposed to, you know, be part of the food chain. Um, but what was interesting to me about that is that word instruction, because that's what the word Torah means. In the, in, in the Old Testament, it says, you know, God gave humans instructions. And that's the Torah, a code to live by, you know, to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Not to covet, not to steal, not to murder, not to commit a d idolatry, which means to make something less than ultimate your focus. Um, so we have our instructions, but each of these communities God made has their own Torah. Um, you know, even in Genesis 1, God commands the earth, you grow grass. And God commands uh, vegetation. You not only have to bear fruit, you have to disseminate seeds that are in the fruit that will grow another tree, that will grow another fruit, that will grow... Um, my daughter, I got, this is an aside. Maybe Cheryl knows I just fool around when I'm teaching. <laughs> I'm expecting my, f our first grandchild this, uh, July. And we hope little Julia will be just come out just right. But it's such a miracle, isn't it? Because little Julia will have all the equipment inside her in that little under 10 pound package she'll require for her whole life. Already there. When she turns 12, she doesn't go to the hospital and they put a bunch of new stuff in her. <laughs> She's already got the seeds of her entire Life, even reproductive life, already inside her. And that's the way in Genesis 1 it describes how God created the world. He created it so that it itself is self-generating. Every piece of fruit has the tree. Oh. But anyway, here's what I wanted to get to about um, every creature has its Torah. Uh, there's another text there. Let's look at it. It's Hosea 2. Hosea chapter 2. And the, the speaker is God through the voice of this prophet. And it, it says, I will cut a covenant with them on that day. With the wildlife of the land. And with the birds in the sky. And with the creepers on the ground. And the bow and the sword in warfare I will shatter from the earth. And I will allow you to lie down in safety. That is because, you know, Christianity is... Incent is an offshoot of Judaism. And Judaism is founded around the idea that God gave humans an instruction manual, which they would call Torah, which is found in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, a guide to live so that you are in harmony with everything else. That's what Torah represents, a guide towards shalom and so we're proud that we've got our covenant but this text says God's got a covenant 
with wildlife, with birds, with reptiles. And so this helps me now, and this is what we're doing in class, kind of re- think what sin means. It is a sin to interfere with another community's ability to be faithful to their instructions. Mountains cannot clap their hands if they've been strip mined. You know, the, the Bible has all these images. Uh, where i got to look them up because I don't have them all in my mind. Um, well, I can just guess them. Oh, heavens declaring the glory of God. Trees and fields clapping their hands. Shed blood crying out from the ground. Heaps of stones witnessing to promises people have made to each other. The ground swallowing sinners. Mountains writhing. Vines languishing. The earth mourning. And we think, oh, those are just metaphors. Just. But, um, you know, the Bible actually is more animated than we imagine. Uh, anthropologists you know when they study religion they, 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 they said they came up with a scheme this is European people you know they came up with a scheme of religious evolution and said the lowest form is to be an animist which is to believe that everything has spirit and then you advance to polytheism and then if you're really on the ball you get to mono theism. Imagine it's primitive to believe that everything has spirit. That everything has a special divine given vitality. The Bible actually has that philosophy. The Bible is animistic and monotheistic. And we haven't seen it. So my point is, it's a sin then to interfere with another community's ability to follow its instructions. Um, yeah, I said before, hills can't shout for joy if their tops have been removed by strip mining. Fish can't swarm seas boiled by an ozone depleted atmosphere. Felled trees can't clap their hands. When we damage our non-human partners, we truly commit the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of that Holy Spirit that is in all things. Um, Wendell Berry goes on to riff on this. He says, you know, we're often, we often refer to sacred places. And, you know, if, if you ever joined the Holy Land tour, you know, the Jew Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce put the fix in several, century, several millennia ago, and everybody thinks, oh, that's the Holy Land. That's a sacred place. And we all flock there. There's no place that ain't sacred. Palestine's no more holy than Podunk. But what Barry says is there are sacred, there aren't sacred and non sacred places, there are sacred and desecrated places. Yeah, desecrated. Desecrated places are places that we, where we have interfered with the ability of that aspect or feature of creation to follow its instructions. You know, we could, we could pause to learn from neighbors 
in other human communities who walk through history with God. In Islam, our brothers, our Muslim brothers and sisters would say, all creation is in Islam. That is a harmonious relationship with God. All creation is. It's fundamentally in sync. Humans, and, and they don't have a concept of original sin. They say humans are actually uh, in sync too, but we kind of tend to fall out of sync. And that's why five times a day you've got to reset your clock and say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And that's why you need to give alms. And that's why you may need to make a holy pilgrimage every so often. And that's why, and that's why, just so you can retune to this cosmic harmony. But everything is in Islam. Um, so that is the, the um, even the created order is actually, it isn't fallen, to use those Christ, that Christian language. So I'm still on this sin idea. I'm hung up on sin. I grew up Baptist. <laughs> Although really it's not that bad, you know. Recently, everybody thinks because I'm from Kentucky and I'm a Baptist, you know, that I can be the resident conservative, like at Yale Divinity School. They need somebody sometimes, you know, to be the con to their pro. And um, so the other day I got invited to speak on a podcast, and it was called Recovering Evangelicals. <laughs> and, you know, I was happy to talk to him. By the way, there's no, you don't get a cent for that stuff. You're supposed to just think, oh, I got another few minutes of, my, of that 15 minutes of fame Andy Warhol promised. You know, that's all. But um, as I thought about it afterwards, I thought, well, I did grow up kind of evangelical, but I didn't have to recover from it. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, they told us that God loved us. That's the one I heard. I didn't really hear that much about sin, you know. So anyway, but now back to sin. Better a millstone were hung around our necks and we were thrown into the sea than we inhibit other life forms from expressing their God-given responsibilities to rejoice in and contribute to the goodness of creation. You get that? So that's kind of the kind of thing we're doing in class to reboot creation. Now, I've come to a little end of a paragraph. And I'm assuming if this started at 1115, you want to quit at noon. So we got more Bible to read. But I'm going to pause and see if anyone wants to make a comment or say something. You. That was great because 
uh, it's a conundrum. What you've said is a beautiful paradox, and uh, I can't dispute anything you said, and I was kind of, you know, uh, stressing the sweetness and light of the whole scene. But it's true that uh, there's a fearful symmetry to creation. And that sometimes tectonic plates hiccup and there's earthquake. And every now and then a meteor violates its instructions and moves out of its orbit and slams into a planet. And then you, you lose whole species, dinosaurs. So all I can say is I understand that. It's true. And that our, there is a place for our wise management shepherding of the world. Um, I remember a physicist once said, you know, if you think about the metaphor of, of the world as a body, a human body, and let's just say the, the rainforest represents the lungs, and we could go on and on, how everything contributes to the body. Well, the humans then are the way the planet thinks. So given that, there are times when we should uh, put our uh, hold on to the gospel plow and, and, and cultivate something new. You're right. Yes. Well, me and you were on the same team, man. So, yes, I love that. I, I, I like the shepherd versus the predator versus the wolf. That's what they did in children's church today, right? Somebody was the wolf. Nobody else? Well, just so we, we got a couple more minutes, let's look at Genesis 1. If I, oh, yeah. Okay, are you ready? At the beginning, do you see it? Of when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was wild and waste. And there was darkness over the surface of the deep, and the breath of God was hovering over the surface of the water. It seems like the most basic theological idea is that God created the world from nothing. And we often say that. There was nothing, and then God began creating. And that may be true, but that's not what this text says. This says, at the beginning of when God created, the earth, reality probably is what it means here, 
was there, but it was wild and waste. It was unformed. There was darkness over the face of the abyss, the cosmic soup. But the breath of God was hovering. So there's, there was something there. So then, the story in Genesis 1 is essentially of God eliciting structure out of amorphous cosmic goo. And the first thing God does is turn on the lights. That's day one. God says, let light be. And then the second thing that God does, it's in verse 6, is start making space. And so God says, let there be a, if everything's kind of this soup, I want my first invention will be what's called in the King James Version, a firmament. But that means it's kind of like the top of a snow globe. A thin piece that we would, that an ancient person would imagine as the dome of sky. And a lot like a colander, because it needs little holes for rain to get through, because there's water up there. So the first thing God does is then create just a little separation, divide everything in two, everything above the firmament everything below. And then verse 9, and God said, let the water, and in, well, in, back in verse 8, God says that, that dome, that firmament, that colander, we'll call it sky. And then in the next event, God says, let the waters, everything is water underneath, let it mass into one place, and when it does, earth is revealed. So it's a beautiful idea that everything was already there, and it's just a question of God shaping the chaos into structure. God called the dry ground earth. Are you still with me? And in verse 11, God says, let the earth grow grass. Let the earth grow grass. Let it, it's as if, God is summoning a, a generativity that's already inside the world. Let the earth grow grass, vegetation disseminating seeds, fruit trees making fruit according to its type. Pineapple tree gives you pineapples, not pears. And it's seed upon the earth. And so it was. And I love the, the imagery. The earth pushed out grass. The trees made the fruit. Already creation itself is participating in creation. And then God saw it was pleasing. There was evening, there's morning, day third. The fourth day, then God starts ornamenting the sky. Uh, lights that serve as signs for seasons. And so there's sun. And moon, a great light and smaller light, as it refers to them. Well, um, we're not going to get to the whole thing. So I'm just going to pause and say, good. Any more comments? Yes. That is a question the Bible doesn't answer. Well, it, in the begin, it, it, yeah, in the beginning is and word in the beginning. Well, let me just say Genesis one doesn't say where that comes from. The Bible would say God created it all, but the point is Genesis one just says. When the, when, the, when the beginning of the movie starts, there's something there. And it's just dark and wet. Because finally, 
Genesis 1 isn't trying to tell us in a scientific way what did alpha moment look like. What it's trying to say is that God is constantly creating structure out of chaos and structure that is fertile and generative and that that makes then for the harmony of everything. So, yes. I agree. Um, it, science, there's no s fight between science and religion. They have their lanes. Um, but they meet in the same place. There are times when they do. I like to think, at its best, religion is the poetry of physics. At its best. It makes it sing. It makes it scan. It creates little rhymes. It it shows, it gives you expressive lyrical language to appreciate the patterns. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll go you and then... <laughs> yeah, this, I agree. This is a kind of, um, uh, again, a, a poem about it.
Okay, I, I so wanted to end once he and I were in total agreement. But let's hear you. No, no, no. Well, that's great. I, you don't hear Aristotle's categories every day. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's all of those things. I think the Bible is myth. If, if you define myth not as something false, but something that is a big story that guides you. But as what I said before, too, and I think it's what he alluded to, the Bible has pathos in it because he, what he says, it's not the story of how the universe came to be, but it evokes feeling and reverence for it. Um, okay. Uh, Cheryl, you going to rescue me? <laughs>